the Justin High School continues to be known for a US president who bans slurs, how could we frame the past as cultural norms shift and our public awareness of white supremacy increases? We hope you can join us for these and other events. To reserve tickets, learn more, or to become a member, visit us at pdxcityclub.org. City Club members are not just faces in the crowd. Our members are leaders from across our community who are working to make our region more informed, inclusive, Welcome to City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Andrew Kallick, a member of City Club's Forum Committee and the producer of today's program. For more than a century, the City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people have worked together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and explore. We're gathered today at the Sentinel Hotel and joined by thousands of Oregonians via X-Ray FM's radio stations, KGW's website, Facebook feed, and news app, and Open Signals com community media television stations. In addition to the City Club's valued media partners, our corporate sponsors enable us to continue to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to recognize City Club's winter sponsor, Portland General Electric, and thank them for their generous support. Please join me in showing our appreciation to our sponsors, as well as the staff and volunteers who have made today's event possible. Today, I'm excited that we get to ask the question, should Oregon host the Olympic Games? Ever since my frugal New England parents inexplicably paid for the Olympics triple cast for the 1992 Summer Games in Barcelona, I have been filled with the Olympic spirit myself. That year, two of my idols were competing for gold, Larry Bird on the hardwood and Jackie Joyner Kersey on the track. 20 years later, I fulfilled my own Olympic dream of becoming a gold medal spectator at the 2012 London Olympics. As a lover of sport and a believer in the importance of global institutions that bring the nations of the world together in competition rather than conflict, I see the Olympics as embodying the better angels of human nature. That said, I think the Olympics and the Olympic flame can distract from and even exacerbate critical urban issues of equity, inclusion, and opportunity. Our discussion today will allow us to examine both sides of the Olympic question, and I hope that we'll learn some lessons from past Olympics that can inform how we approach major sporting events here in Oregon. Today, I'm honored to introduce our four tremendous panelists and our moderator. Mariel Zagunas is a four-time Olympic medalist in fencing who grew up right here in the Portland metro area. 
Ms. Zaguna served as the flag bearer for the United States delegation in 2012, and in 2013 was inducted into the International Fencing Hall of Fame. Jules Boykoff, to her left, is a political science professor at Pacific University and the author of three books on the Olympic Games, including Power Games, A Political History of the Olympics. To Jules' left is Ben Lanana, the president of Tracktown USA and associate athletic director for Olympic development at the University of Oregon in the city of Eugene. He was also the head coach of the U.S. men's track and field team at the 2016 Games in Rio, where Team USA brought home a record number of medals. On the far side, Damian Smith is the founder and managing partner of Pepper Foster Consulting and the organizer of Oregon 2028, an effort to bring the Summer Olympics to our state. And at the end, our moderator is Len Bergstein, the founder and president of Northwest Strategies and a founding board member of the Oregon Sports Authority. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks all of you for being here. Um, the Olympic spirit has uh, always inspired Oregonians to get in the game. 25 years ago, a, an Olympic luge competitor by the name of Jack Elder went around the community to try and uh, encourage uh, Oregon and Portland to get the Winter Games. He fell short in that effort, but what he did do was inspire an organization called the Oregon Sports Authority, which for the last 25 years has been this community's uh, sports chamber of commerce and has bought uh, about 200 uh, events and about $300 million of economic benefit into the state. So Jack's uh, uh, efforts uh, bore quite a lot of fruit. Uh, we, um, in 2002, Show De Zono, who many of you in this room know, uh, was the main sponsor to try and bring the uh, Olympic torch run through Portland uh, on its way to Salt Lake City. Through Show's uh, efforts, we were able to get that run here, and I brought the torch that I schlepped up uh, Bur uh, West Burnside uh, up towards Powell uh, in 2002 uh, as my part of, uh, of that particular effort. It's a, really a very uh, thrilling aspect in which you, when you watch the torch going tonight to the opening ceremonies, you get a feeling for what it's like to be a part of, of those events uh, for all time. Oregonians have cheered uh, their uh, the sports ath athletes, like Mario, who's been uh, there in, uh, and winning medals for us. Uh, but there were also, at the same time, a lot of voices that caution us to say, look, let's make sure that we uh, measure up the grim reality of the sport uh, with, the, uh, with the glitzy uh, kind of promises of it. So today, as we have the first of, of opening ceremonies later in the day, uh, City Club is taking its rightful place in bringing this debate forward. We're taking center stage in, in, the, in this discussion. Our panel will explore a broad range of issues, as Andrew already said. Uh, are the big economic and emotional lifestyle prizes, are they worth it in terms of the big challenges and huge budgets that it takes to come here? Can Oregon leverage uh, any legacy benefits out of this? Some communities have been able to get legacy benefits and some of them have failed in that effort. And what about the controversies over equity? Uh, who bears the burden and the cost and who should uh, inside and outside the Olympic bu uh, bubble? I'm going to start with a couple of people who are really very knowledgeable and have uh, national reputations for talking about this. First of all, Jules, I'm going to ask you to help us kick off the conversation with your take on the economics and logistics. You've excelled as an athlete, you've written uh, incisive books about this topic, and you have a, a, an article in today's LA Times uh, ra put it, placing out the, the choices that are in front of us. Uh, and so uh, I guess the question is, what should Oregonians be concerned about uh, when they think about an Olympic bid? Thanks very much, Len. Um, first, I should say that there's so much to really appreciate about the Olympics, the amazing athletes that we're going to see here at Pyeongchang and that we've seen in the past. We're fortunate to have Marielle on our panel here. She's excelled at the Olympic level. I watch the Olympics with my family, and I really enjoy that part. 
I think if we're going to try to address the question of should Oregon host the Olympics, though, we should try to set our appreciation for the athletics to the side just for a moment and try to have a real clear-eyed view of the reality of the Olympics in the 21st century. And so I guess I'd like to lay out a couple trends that, that I see and that researchers, academic researchers, have found that are definitely the case here in the 21st century with the Olympics. And the first one is that there are skyrocketing costs with the Olympic Games. And so you look at the ones that are happening today, Pyeongchang, they were originally supposed to cost $6 billion, and they ended up costing $13 billion. Tokyo 2020, the next Olympics, was supposed to cost around $7 billion, and those costs have ex escalated to around $20 billion now, and we still have a ways to go. That has become par for the course. Every single Olympics since 1960, for which there is reliable data, has had cost overruns of that type of variety, and we should be aware of that. The second thing I would say is to be aware of is the downside, if you will, of the Olympics is your city, if you host the games, gets militarized. The military literally comes to your town to police the games. The Olympics have become so big and important and amazing that they've become an explicit target of terrorists around the globe. And so therefore, you have to ramp up your security. It costs billions of dollars, and it really changes the face of your city. I was in London during the Olympics there where they ratcheted missiles to the top of apartment buildings. I mean, you could have accidentally thought that you'd walked into a military hardware convention in certain parts of London. It was really intense. So that, we have to think about, would we want that in Portland as well? And third, you know, you see at the front end of the Olympics when all the bids are happening, these big grand promises that sound really awesome, glitzy, as Glenn, as Len said there. And so they sound awesome. Wow, I could go for that. But then what happens almost inevitably with every one of the Olympics we've seen in recent years is that those big promises evaporate. Think of Rio de Janeiro, where I also lived in the lead up to the Olympics, and so I know that city very well and care much about it. We saw big promises about Guanabara Bay. It was going to be cleaned up. The water was going to be filtered. And that was going to be a great legacy of those Olympics. It just simply didn't happen, unfortunately. Unless we think it's a function of South America or something like that, uh, Vancouver had big promises of social housing. And those ended up falling through. We often hear that we're going to have the Olympic Village be converted into housing for the people. It just simply hasn't happened yet, unfortunately. So. We need to be aware of those as we go here. The Portland City Club uh, brings together civic-minded people, as the Twitter tagline says, to pursue a more just and equitable Portland. And so I would just say that based on recent history of the Olympics, uh, this would, the Olympics, if we hosted them, would take us in the very opposite direction, unfortunately. The Olympics are basically, from an economic perspective, trickle-up economics that tend to favor the rich and um, so I, because of that, and it marginalizes the poor at the same time. We can talk, I can give lots of examples, unfortunately, of that later. So while I really love the Olympics and I can support the athletes and I'll watch the opening ceremonies tonight, at this stage of the history of the Olympics, I absolutely do not think we should have, a, I think we should have a lot of caution before bringing it to our beloved state of Oregon. Okay, thanks for the yellow lights uh, and the caution. Uh, Damien, uh, let's hear your response. Uh, you've heard the concerns that have been raised. Uh, you've been motivated to bring uh, Olympics to uh, Oregon. Uh, you have a great website, which I hope you'll give. Uh, you know, you'll you'll uh, you'll tell people how to reach the information that you've you've got. But also, what we've got here is uh, a situation where there are a bunch of concerns that Jules has raised. And why don't you tell us why Oregon doesn't have to worry about those concerns? Uh, oh, thank you, Len, uh, and thanks, Jules. And I'm not going to stand here and say we don't have to worry about those concerns. We absolutely have to worry about those concerns. Uh, we have to go into this with eyes wide open, and we have to make sure that we've got guidelines, principles, and, and operating structure to prevent the issues that, that Jules is talking about. So uh, as Len mentioned, we, we started to put together an opportunity to look at Oregon as hosting the Olympics a little while ago, a couple of years ago. And there is a website out there called Oregon2028.com that outlines our plan, our guidelines, our structure, and also has feedback on it from the community, both positive and negative, and then uh, our sort of uh, responses to some of that feedback, both positive and negative. So if you do have an opportunity, please do check it out. Uh, obviously, with LA winning 2028, that website's now a little bit uh, obsolete, but it still lays down the foundations for what we might want to look at if we want to come back and look at Oregon hosting Olympics and maybe 
realistically 2036 or 2040 as our, as our earliest opportunity. Uh, to go back to Jules' points, um, skyrocketing costs, yes. Everybody puts together a budget and it does, generally speaking, go over. Uh, there's a certain number of factors in, involved in that. One of them is just inflation. When you put together your budget, you're putting together your budget based on the data available on that day and the, and the value of your dollars at that point, and then you have inflation. So in certain circumstances, for example, Montreal in 76 and Rio in 2016, a large part of the skyrocketing cost was inflation, massive inflation in those, in those uh, uh, countries. I think uh, Rio was running about 11% inflation going into the games. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to have to manage that and manage that very quiet, very, very capably. Uh, the one counterpoint I'll get to you is, is uh, here in Oregon, we run big projects all the time and deliver them under budget. The, a good example of that is the Orange Line, the Max Line. Uh, that was a $1.8 billion project that came in on time under budget. None of the projects that we would need to build for the Olympics would be bigger than that project individually. So if we've got the teams running each of those projects individually, we can deliver and successfully deliver those projects under budget. That doesn't mean we don't need to worry about it and look at it. When we did the numbers, the rough numbers for Oregon 2028, we looked at a cost, total cost package of around about $10 billion based on 2015, 2016 dollars. By 2040, it's gonna be way more than $10 billion just because of inflation. As we get closer and closer to a realized bid, you have to get a lot more detail on exactly what, what's involved in, in putting that together. Uh, having said that, just because you have es escalating costs, it doesn't necessarily mean that the games aren't profitable. There have been several profitable or break-even games. London is perhaps the best example. Uh, that one ended up costing $14.6 billion and was a break-even game. And as a result of that, they did get, for example, affordable housing. So the East Village, which was the Olympic Village that was developed for uh, hosting the athletes during the London Games, is 50% affordable housing, 49% affordable housing. And what's more interesting about that is that following the Games, the development around that Olympic uh, Centennial uh, Park, uh, they've put in a lot more housing, and yet the, the prices have gone up because the development of the area has made it a much more... Uh, uh, a successful and, and uh, desired neighborhood, but still to this day, 29%, 30% of the housing that's being developed is, is affordable housing per the guidelines that were put in place as a result of the Olympics, compared to what we're doing in Portland right now, which is 20%. So right now the guidelines in Portland are 20% affordable housing versus 30% that's happening in that area of London right now. So again, given the right controls and guidelines and legislation, we can deliver a successful affordable housing as part of this, part of this result. Uh, the militarization because of ter ter terrorism, I, I, yes, uh, unfortunately that's just the reality of the world we live in. Uh, there aren't missiles still on rooftops in London anymore. Uh, they've been taken down. Um, and yes, it's gonna look, it's gonna be uh, you know, pretty intense security and the cost of that security is one of the key things we absolutely, absolutely need to look at. Cost of securing LA probably going to run one and a half, two billion dollars uh, in 2028. So uh, that is a big number and it's a big responsibility. Unfortunately, I don't see a way around that. Uh, again, going back to uh, the, 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 the supporting the Olympics but not in my backyard, it, it's kind of disingenuous, right? If, if we want to have the Olympics, don't we owe it to the world to show how you can do it right? If we want to participate and watch the Olympics and enjoy the Olympics and have our athletes compete in the Olympics, don't we want to be part of the movement that from the inside is correcting and doing it the right way and showing how you can do it in a positive way? So that's my view on sort of our responsibility to the Olympics, but more importantly for me, this is all about what the Olympics can do for us and what it can do for Oregon. And that's, that's the reason we got into it, um, was, was because of the community impact. I'm, I'm not an athlete. Um, I, I'm a very voracious watcher of sports and I'm a big Timbers fan, but I was always the last one picked on the, the school playground. Um, what I got into this for was purely because of the benefits or the potential benefits that could the benefit Oregon and the community here and access to basically $9 billion worth of money that we wouldn't have access to otherwise that we can use for projects here that we can do well with. Damien, we're going to come back to let you and Jules argue some more about cost benefits. We're going to get to our the two other panelists who really typify the uh, cultural and emotional benefits of, uh, of the games. But first, I want to just say a word for our broadcast audience. This is the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Len Bergstein, and today we're asking whether Oregon should host the Olympic Games with Mario Zagunas, a four-time Olympic medalist, Jules Boykoff, an associate professor of public 
political science at Pacific University. Damien Smith, founder and managing partner of Pepper Foster Consulting, and Vin Lanana, president of Tracktown USA, and associate athletic director of the athletic uh, of Olympic development at the University of Oregon. So thanks uh, for all of you who are listening in. Vince, let, Vin, let's turn to you. What, to explain a little bit to you what the to the audience what the Olympics means to you and to the athletes that you've been a part of, and you know, what's the uh, what, What's the emotional and cultural uh, activity that you've been involved in? Well, then the, the context for me is I served as the United States head Olympic coach for men's track and field in 2016, an assistant coach in 2004, and I've coached a bunch of athletes who've competed at the Olympic Games. And to me, I'm not sure that there is a greater, more exciting, uh, inspiring, event anywhere in the world than the Olympic Games. As we watch tonight in the opening ceremonies and we see the pageantry that goes in, and that's all the stuff that you see on broadcast, etc. But really what you see, and most of the time I've spent my time in the trenches kind of getting the athletes prepared and not being a spectator but actually working at the Olympic Games, and the experience inside the stadium, the energy from the athletes. The, it's, it represents everything. You know, you think about the Olympic spirit, you think about the values of sport and culture. It all gets bowled up in those five rings. And so me, for, for me personally, I am a uh, big supporter of the Olympics. I can't speak to the economic pieces of it, but I can speak that for uh, since the first modern Olympic Games, we have uh, 14 countries to Rio in 2016, where there are 207 countries. For the athletes, it's a culmination of their lifelong training. Uh, the cities get to show off all of the things that they believe in. And to me, I think that you have an opportunity here to capture what is really special about the place where the event is hosted. So I'm pretty excited about it. Great. We're going to come back to, for, uh, to you for some more. But Mario, uh, you're one of the most accomplished uh, Oregon uh, Olympic athletes, uh, obviously winning gold at uh, 19, first time in, uh, in 100 years that uh, the U.S. got gold in fencing. Uh, what has Olympics meant to you, and what do you think having Olympics in your backyard will mean for the sport? Well, the Olympics have played a big part in my life. Uh, as you mentioned, I won my first Olympic gold medal at age 19 in the 2004 Olympic Games in Athens, and then was able to repeat Four years later at the Beijing Olympics with another individual gold medal and a team bronze medal. In 2012, I was elected to be the flag bearer for the, the Team USA in the opening ceremony. So if you, you watch the opening ceremony tonight on, on TV, you'll see that one person who's um, elected by the rest of Team USA to represent the entire team. And so that was a huge honor in 2012 to have that and have the world watch uh, me lead Team USA into the, the opening ceremony. and then. Two summers ago, in 2016, I won another uh, bronze medal in the team event in Rio. So I've had some incredible Olympic experiences, and I also want to point out that my first Olympic experience in Athens, the birthplace of the the Olympic Games, the ancient Olympics and the modern Olympic Games, Athens Olympics, like, was the most amazing experience because that is the the epitome of of the Olympic Games. And then four years later in Beijing, um, I think that was probably one of the first times that you started hearing about the cost of the Olympic Games. China just went above and beyond and spent more money than anybody ever had, any country ever had on the Olympic Games and kind of set off this uh, precedent, I think, for the rest of the Olympics, which was probably for better or for worse. But um, to have that experience and then in 2012 to be in, in London, which is a modern city, huge city, uh, and then in Rio, the first time that the Olympics were hosted in South America. So I've had a very fortunate kind of spectrum of um, experiences in different countries for the Olympics, and, and it's really been an amazing thing as an athlete to have all those experiences throughout the past, um, since I was 19, a <laughs> long time. So without trying putting you too much on the spot, do you think Oregon's got the chops to be able to pull off a big event like this? That is, I mean, it's a very loaded question, and hearing what everybody has to say, I think I'm, I'm more in Vin's court where I have experienced as an athlete, and I, I have never had to think about the economic impact, but I do, being born and raised in Portland, I do love my city, I love my state, and I 
would only want the best for it. So it's really, really difficult to hear both sides of the coin and to see that it could have a lot of detrimental consequences, but also as an athlete, it would be absolutely amazing to see the Olympics hosted here because the Olympics are so amazing. So I can't say either way, and especially if you look at, what do you say, 2040 yeah. would be? So I could probably safely say I wouldn't be competing by then. Um, so then, then maybe I would have a different perspective as um, you know, either a spectator or, or just a resident of Portland or of Oregon to, to say either way. But as an athlete, I think there's nothing like competing in your backyard. And I think that LA in 2028, it, we can kind of see how they do. I know LA is obviously a much bigger city than Portland. California is a much bigger state than Oregon. But I think it would be interesting to see how the U.S. hosts the games after so long, the summer games after so many years, um, to kind of see how they do and how they come out on the other side. And maybe Oregon, Portland can learn a few things from them and take it from there. Finn, you've been involved in the big events. You've been, gone to Olympics. You've also staged very big events. You've made Eugene track town. And you, uh, we're all pr very pleased with you with you've done it. What do you, what's your sense of the question I asked, Mary Hall? Well, at the end of the day, I, I, I love the state, of, the state of Oregon. And I think it would be a different kind of Olympics in Oregon than it is in some of these other cities. I think that for sure it would be a, in my view, it would be a West Coast or a statewide event, which would be a very different kind of Olympics than there's been in any of the major cities. Uh, but I, I think I always go back to, so I'm, I'm in favor of, the, of uh, the Olympics in the state of Oregon. And you think we can pull it off? I, I do. I do. And I, I, I look at Allison Felix, the most decorated female athlete in the world. I, she told me this great story when she was a, a kid and she watched the Olympic Games in Atlanta in 96. She developed her heroes. She developed what her path would be as an athlete. And she is, for those of you who know Allison, she's just a phenomenal human being. And I think that the impact that those Olympics could have on the youth, not only of, not only of the state of Oregon, and not only in the United States, but the youth of the world, could really be motivated to see a, a city, a state, that could do the Olympic Games the right way. And that's kind of how I would go on it. Jules, you've written a lot about communities that haven't done it the right way. I'm really interested in when you've written about inside and outside the bubble. Would you talk a little bit about that and what you think the issues are that involved with staging games that really are, have an equitable, uh, the benefits and costs are spread in the community appropriately? Absolutely. So my background is, uh, I, as a researcher and scholar, would move to where the Olympics are being held, whether it was London in 2012 or Rio in 2016, and I would embed myself in the community and I would talk to people outside of the Olympic sphere, outside of the small group of people that are developing the hotels and so on for the Olympics, actual everyday people who would be affected by the Olympics. In Rio de Janeiro, it was pretty sharp-edged in the sense that there were 77,000 people who were displaced to make way for infrastructure for the Olympics. 77,000, that's a medium-sized town here in Oregon. And so that many people were affected in a negative way. I went and talked to those people. They couldn't buy tickets to the Olympics. Um, and they were totally excluded and they had their lives really changed. And I became very sympathetic to their causes. And all too often, they're sort of forgotten about. And so when you think about London, Damien, you were mentioning London and East London. So again, I lived there. I met actual people who were affected in Hackney Wick, one of the areas, the five boroughs I think that you're referring to. And just because you call something affordable housing doesn't mean it is. I mean, look at the Olympic Village. You turn, you call it apartments at 1,500 pounds a month affordable housing. You label it that. Who can afford 1,500 pounds a month? It's coming up on $2,000 a month. There's actually a word, Damien, for what you described there, where when the neighborhood starts to look nice and you get nice coffee shops and little beer pubs and the cost of living tends to go up, I'll tell you what, it starts with G and it ends in gentrification. It's gentrification. So if you are comfortable with gentrification, you're going to love having the Olympics in Portland. We don't need that kind of thing. We're already struggling with gentrification in Portland. Gentrification has real world effects for people in the Olympic city and there's no question that gentrification has become part and parcel of the Olympics. Even in the Olympics, 
that Damien and his, his uh, fellow comrades who are trying to bring the Olympics here mention on their website the Barcelona Games of 1992, or, which are often pointed to as a successful games. You saw a 250% rise in the cost of living as the Olympics came to town. You also, just as a side note, for those Barcelona, those really successful Barcelona Olympics, they were originally supposed to cost $667 million. They ended up costing $11 billion. And guess who pays that? The people who are living in the city. Barcelona had about one-third input from private companies, and, and that's the most in the history of the Olympics, one-third participation from private entities. So, I would say local communities in general are negatively affected unless they happen to be well connected uh, in the construction industry. There's definitely people who benefit from the Olympics. There's plenty of money circulating around. As I say, it tends to go to people who are doing quite well. And while there's lots of promises and great ideas even about how you can spread that money around and have it go to people who really need it, when push comes to shove and you've got to meet that deadline, it simply hasn't happened in the recent history of the Olympics. Right. Damien, let me get, give you a chance to kind of respond. How do you match up uh, the Olympics with the vision of what you ha what you think of when you think of Portland or Oregon. How do, how do those match and how do you avoid the problems that, uh, that, that, that we've just heard uh, Jules talk about? So I, I, I want to echo something that Vin says. Uh, if we host the Olympics in Oregon, it is not going to look like London. It's not going to look like uh, Rio. It's not going to look like Beijing. It's going to look like Oregon. And uh, the only reason and the only way that we would ever bid to host the Olympics is if it reflects us and our culture and our values and our guidelines. So we always went into this with a, if we can put together a bid that fairly represents Oregon and, and it's a bid that represents the way that we want to host the Olympics, a different way, and if we lose because of that, that's fine. We don't want to compromise our values or our guidelines in order to win. Uh, so you can bid an Olympics in line with your own guidelines. Now, the question is, will you win or not? That's another question, but we didn't ever want to go into this with the idea of, of, of uh, compromising those to, to win. So a different kind of Olympics. For a start, we didn't want to bid this as Portland. Uh, we wanted to bid it as Oregon. The first time it would have been bid as a state rather than a city. And there's a very deliberate reason for that. One of the key factors that comes in around Oregon is, is uh, first of all, we don't have all the venues we need in Portland, but we have nearly all of the venues we need. If you go down the, to Corvallis and Eugene and you go back up to, to the border of Vancouver and pull, pull in the Expo Center, now I've got most of the venues I need. Plus, I want sailing on the coast and I want white water uh, off around Mount Hood area or, or even in Bend. So I can bring in the whole state and do this without spending as anywhere near as much money as if I said it was all going to be in Portland. I want to build the Olympics in a sustainable, zero carbon, zero waste way. I don't want to displace, uh, displace the poor. I, don't want to, I do want to gentrify a neighborhood, perhaps, but I want to gentrify an industrial neighborhood the same way that perhaps the Pearl was uh, gentrified and with affordable housing. So look at the Pearl District, for example. There's like six or seven affordable housing or income-restricted buildings in the Pearl right next to some of the most expensive real estate in our city. I want to echo that, but I want to do it in an industrial zone, an area that's currently zoned uh, a brown site or a, a zone that's currently zoned industrial and not used that way. I'm not talking about displacing poor people. I'm talking about building housing close to downtown that is affordable. Um, and I want to do that using other people's money. I mean, that's basically what the, the whole goal is, is uh, I, can get, I can get about $5 billion just from the people selling sponsorships and, and, and then getting the, uh, paying for tickets, et cetera, people coming in and the tourist dollars. So I'm, I'm getting access to, we did the rough math, as I said, 10 billion. Around about a billion of that would need to be funded by us, by taxpayers. But again, just to put that in perspective, that's a billion dollars over eight years. It's $125 million a year. I think we spent $48 billion of public money in Oregon last year. So we're talking about 125 million out of 48 billion, and then our GDP is over 200 billion. So we're talking about a very, very small amount of money. The rest of it is coming from private interests. It's coming from ticket sales and sponsorships. It's coming from the federal government. And we can get a large bang for our buck. That's a nine to one return right there just by, just by doing this thing. But what we're left with is the legacy of affordable housing, 
new transportation infrastructure, a new downtown neighborhood built on industrial land that is now fit for, for uh, is like a showcase of zero carbon, zero waste, sustainable living, pedestrian friendly, et cetera. Damien, and, I think probably when we get to the questions, there'll be some people who will ask you where that one billion is going to come from for a little bit. Mariel, I'm going to come to you next and ask you a question about what makes for a good Olympics from the uh, athlete's point of view, what kind of facilities, what, where you've been, and the same thing with you, Vin. What, uh, what you've seen in other communities that really make, uh, make uh, the athletics uh, you know, really meaningful uh, and see whether we can do that. But let me give this moderator a broadcast mention one more time for our uh, broadcast audience. This is the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Len Bergstein, and today we're asking whether Oregon should host the Olympic Games with Mario Zagunas, a four-time Olympic me medalist, Jules Boykoff, an associate professor of political science at Pacific University, Damien Smith, founder and managing partner at Pepper Foster Consulting, and Vin Lanana, president of Tracktown USA, and associate athletic director uh, for Olympic development at the University of uh, Oregon. So, Mario, what makes for a good Olympics from an athlete's point of view? Uh, so, as I mentioned, I've had a very wide range of Olympic experiences from Athens, Greece, Beijing, China, London, England, and Rio uh, de Janeiro in Brazil. So if you just look at those cities, not only as Olympic host cities, but just as themselves, each is so, so different from the other. And so I've had a very uh, interesting experience in each city every Olympics where you are in the Olympic bubble, but you also are experiencing the culture and the um, kind of the, the best of that country or the best of that city and their culture and they're really putting on a show for you and they're making sure that the athletes are really, really well taken care of. And when I say Olympic bubble, that is, is very, very true because you get there and that city is transformed. It's Olympic time and they make everything comfortable for the athletes. They make sure that everything is running smoothly. They make sure you have everything that you, that you need. and Maybe that experience isn't the same for the spectators and the people who live there, but as an, as an athlete, you really just, um, you just don't really think that anything else matters at the moment. You know, you just, you, you're, in your, you're in the Olympic bubble, and, and I know that maybe once the whole whirlwind is, is over, it's left maybe in shambles sometimes, and, and the residents aren't very happy with that, but from my experience, even if there is just chaos going on outside, when you're in the Olympic bubble, it, everything seems perfect. And, and I think that they do that on purpose to make sure that the athletes have everything that they need so they can compete and concentrate at the highest level that they need to. And for better or for worse, I mean, that's been my experience, honestly, as an athlete, is even when you read all these cr crazy things that are going on um, in all of the news stories, you don't really see that as an athlete because you are very well taken care of and they do a very good job shadowing all of the maybe negative things that are going on at the same time that you're there. But that's just honestly Great. how it's been yeah. for me. Then from your experience, what parts of the infrastructure do you think added to the athletics uh, experience uh, in the cities that you've been involved in? And do you think, or again, Oregon's capable of uh, building out the infrastructure? I'm going to come to Damien and uh, Jules later to kind of see what are the actual elements of the infrastructure we would need to be competitive. But what's been your experience? Well, everything that, everything that we have done in staging the Olympic trials and any other things that we've done in Oregon, it is, uh, everything we do is uh, athlete-centric. And I think that uh, whether it's the distance that someone goes from the Olympic Village to the stadium, whether it's uh, how they get around the city, it depends on some of the things that Damien talked about as it, if it were in Oregon, looking at uh, the rivers and the coast and all the things, the accessibility to those things. And even though the athletes are focused on really one and only one thing, they still want to experience the other things around it. And I think Oregon may not have all the infrastructure in place, but I do think it'll be a different kind of Olympics. The thing I was telling the scholars that earlier today was that the coolest thing about the Olympic Games is being in the dining hall. That may sound like a silly thing. But in the dining hall, remember that every athlete from every sport, from every country, are sitting in a 24 hour a day dining hall and interacting with one another. And in the end of the day, they're not sitting around talking about some of the things we're talking about. They're talking about their lifelong experiences, how they've trained for this, how this is their moment. 
And that, to me, is, I don't know how that can be uh, monetized, but certainly at the same time, I can say that it's something really special. Yeah. Damien, let me come back to you and say, if, in order to win a bid, you're going to have to impress some IOC committee that, in fact, Oregon can, in fact, build out its infrastructure uh, and come up with a billion dollars. So if, what's your pitch to people in this age of deficits and budget shortfalls that you can convince someone that Oregon's actually going to be able to come up with the money for the facilities you're going to list that we need to have? Yeah, so the first, first point on the infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure basically comes down to the facilities that you need that the IOC specifies in terms of stadiums and uh, 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 accommodations, et cetera. Uh, and then there's transportation infrastructure to get people in and out uh, of the city. So we did, uh, one of our first steps when we started looking at this was a feasibility study. And uh, is it even possible for Oregon to host the Olympic Games? And we were very pleasantly surprised to find that we have nearly everything we need already. For example, our airport is already more than capable of handling Olympic level traffic. So no upgrades needed to that level. We already have a public transportation infrastructure, which with the addition of a little bit more rolling stock, possibly at a transition time when you're retiring old rolling stock and adding new rolling stock, can handle the traffic levels. Uh, we don't have enough hotels, but actually right now we're building a lot more hotels. And with the sharing economy and, and uh, uh, things like Airbnb and VRBO, uh, access to uh, 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 hotel space, as it were, or the equivalent of hotel space is much easier, especially if you build apartments to be affordable housing post games and use them as Airbnb hotel rooms during the games uh, for the people visiting. Uh, the big things that we did think we needed to build, uh, there definitely needed to be some public transportation infrastructure uh, and potentially some work on the roads, although actually history has shown traffic declines during an Olympics. Uh, actually, rather than going up, because all the locals stay at home, they don't want to go. They don't want to go into the town. Uh, so we probably don't need to do much for the roads. We do want to add some rolling stock. We probably want to do uh, a little bit more uh, uh, work around that. We wanted to put in high-speed rail between Eugene and Portland as a first step towards joining together uh, the California high-speed rail all the way up to potentially Vancouver long term, and using the Olympics as a catalyst to actually get that moving. The, the study work around that has already been budgeted, but it hasn't actually uh, taken place. Uh, and uh, again, what we're looking there is to provide a catalyst to both private investment and then also potentially federal and state level investment in, in that transportation infrastructure. When it comes down to stadiums and other buildings, we basically need five things. Uh, we need uh, an Olympic village, which as I've said before, we build that as a mixed income neighborhood, 50% uh, of which becomes affordable housing. Affordable is relative basically to the cost of the city. So, 1,500 pounds doesn't sound very affordable to us, but as a Londoner, I can tell you that's damn cheap in London um, uh, compared to everything else. And, and it's all relative to income levels and, and whatever things going to happen. But so if we build a, an Olympic village, which is designed to be mixed income housing, including affordable housing. We build a media center, which we build as, as perhaps startup community office space. Uh, we need a velodrome. Uh, that's perhaps the least beneficial long-term uh, in, uh, infrastructure that we'd need is an Olympic level velodrome. Having said that, there is a velodrome here already in Oregon uh, that does have some traffic. It's just not, not uh, big enough for, for an Olympics level. So that one is a little bit dodgy in terms of would we actually maybe use that after the Olympics as well as we could, but everything else we can use after. Uh, we need an aquatic center. Our plan was to build that either as a community aquatic center that's uh, focused around that and build out um, partner with the local universities and or high schools to make that an aquatic center that's used for youth uh, and uh, population afterwards. And then we need a stadium capable of hosting the, uh, the uh, opening and closing ceremony. Uh, that stadium in our minds was a new MLB stadium or a new MLS stadium uh, or uh, Timbers Thorn Stadium on the basis that uh, the Timbers is already uh, outselling its stadium and other MLS teams are already uh, generating 40, 50,000 seats uh, sold every game, Atlanta and Seattle as being prime examples. So there's again options there to build that stadium and have it used afterwards in the same way that London converted their Olympic Stadium to the West Ham uh, soccer stadium to, to, to get that forward. And Atlanta did the same thing with the Braves. So Jules, do you buy that any of these facilities or stadiums are a legacy worth uh, the costs that are involved? Well, I think that that would be up for the people of Oregon to decide and hopefully would actually get a chance to weigh in on this. I mean, I've long argued that if we're going to take on a mega project like this with a history of cost overruns and all the issues we've been talking about, that it should automatically go for a referendum to the public. The public should get a chance to weigh in. 
And when that does happen, we've seen with recent Olympic cities that city after city, everyday people have just said no. There could be some potential infrastructure benefits. I've seen in a few cities recently with the Olympics that there's been some transport that's been developed that people are using. So it's definitely possible. Of course, that doesn't necessarily come cheaply either. And I think you made the good point before, Len, that we would have a lot of arguing to do with people in a time of scarcity to try to get all these billions of dollars thrown towards an Olympic Games. Damien mentioned a really interesting feature of the, all this that we haven't talked about, which is the International Olympic Committee. It's a group of about, well, right now it has 100 members. And they basically come to your city and they expect the full treatment, these guys. When I say guys, I mean guys. They're like 80% guys. And they didn't allow women to join the organization until 1981, OK? The Reagan era is when they finally started letting people in. They expect five-star hotels. They expect the best of the best. They expect special driving lanes to be set up for them and for the athletes, to be sure. And I think the athletes, coaches, medics should get special driving lanes so they can get to their events on time. But guess who else gets to use them? The International Olympic Committee and the corporate sponsors like Coca-Cola. So you're going to have that coming to Oregon as well, something to think about. So do we really want to have this organization, the International Olympic Committee, who largely is a parastate who acts like a parasite when they come to your town, <laughs> do we really want these guys coming to Oregon and basically bossing us around and saying, you know, the temperature in my room's not high enough. It actually, they have documents. It's supposed to be between 70 and 72 degrees in all of their hotel rooms. This is what I'm talking about. So you're talking about a, a privileged sliver of the global 1% that will come to Oregon and expect us all to be serving them like they're our masters. You made that point pretty well, Joel. Uh, that was pretty good. We've got a couple minutes before uh, questions, I think, from the audience. So let me close with uh, Vin, you, and Mario. A lot of people, when they've talked to me about this discussion we're going to have, said it's worth it if Oregon gets some sort of legacy out of this, if there's something that we get that's unique out of uh, having the Olympics. Uh, from your perspective, Vin first, and then Mario, is there, a, is there is that, does that thinking make sense? And is there a legacy that you think of as important for Oregon to look for in having uh, and staging the Olympics? Well, I don't know if I would, if I would uh, focus on a legacy project as in a physical or an infrastructure and all that. I'll leave that to others. I think the legacy is around the youth of the world. And are we inspiring a next generation? Are we talking about anti-obesity? Are we, we are talking about the best athletes on the planet. And I think we have the opportunity to really set up what we need in the, in the country and in the world, a model citizens. And I, I think I would kick them to the athletes like Marielle. So I would kick it to her to let her respond to that. I would definitely mm -hmm. echo what you said. I think that the most important thing is to inspire the next generation. And, and just like you mentioned with Allison Felix, I too watched the 96 games and was like, oh, I want to go to the Olympics. And I want to meet this person, this person, and, and do this. It looks so fun and so cool. And even now today, even though I'm still a competitive fencer, I'm competing against younger female saber fencers who say, I started fencing because I saw you on TV win, a, win an Olympic gold medal. And I think that that's something that is, is really unique and cool. And if we could not only inspire our city and our state and our country, but the world with putting on a display of incredible athleticism and getting the next generation involved in Olympic sports and just keep keep the excitement going on about the Olympic Games, I think that that's really important, just as long as our city and our state can stay intact. I think that's also important. Great. Very stimulating conversation. So let me make a transition to the questions that we're going to have from the audience. Uh, uh, this is the way this works. If you've got a written uh, question, you, you can write this on an index card, hold it high for staff to collect. You can also submit questions through Twitter using the hashtag for Friday forum. I'll try and read at least one index card. Uh, the staff will get me that. I think, Andrew, you'll get me uh, at least one index card question or one from Twitter so I can get the audience that's not here dished into the conversation. We invite City Club members who are here to ask their questions at the microphone that's been set up. Uh, asking the question at the Friday forum uh, microphone is a benefit of City Club membership and memberships, of course, open to all of you uh, uh, at all times. Please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask one question in 30 seconds or less. If you want to identify a specific 
uh, panelists to answer the question, please do. And I think what we, because of the, the we're, we're graced with the, uh, the presence of the civic scholars, they get the, uh, the privilege of asking the first question. So let's go to the microphone and have your first question. Uh, are there gonna be a couple of you or just uh, 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 ask? Go ahead. go ahead. Riley, go ahead. Hello, I am a City Club member. I am from David Douglas. Um, my question is, you guys have talked a lot about the physical and the economic um, cost of the Olympics, but not really about the media, social, or emotional that would affect the citizens of Oregon uh, because of all the media, as I said before. Um, what would those be? Because all eyes would be, like the world's eyes would be on us. So is that another conversation that we should have? Great, Damien, you wanna take the first whack at that? Yeah, actually, uh, thank you for the question. It, it, it's uh, one of the key reasons that we actually wanted to do this was uh, we view the, the positive outcomes of this uh, emotionally could be enormously beneficial. So for example, uh, Oregon has uh, a sort of like little brother to, uh, to Washington and not quite as big as California sort of mindset. And uh, I think that affects how uh, how we look at the world and how our youth and our children look at the world. Imagine the impact, the emotional impact of having one of the world's biggest events happening in your backyard when you're still in school. And you see these things happen. You see your state host this event. You see all the positive benefits of, of that. You see your places you know on TV. You see your friends going to those games. You see athletes. You see the best. The emotional impact of that is to think, I can do anything. I can do anything because I've seen what my state can do and I've seen what the people around me can do and I can see what these athletes can do. So I actually think that the positive emotional impact and, uh, on this is, is enormously beneficial in terms of what it can do to the mindset of, of Oregonians and going forward. There's, there's also another aspect of this emotional which is like everybody that is trying to be successful in whatever field they are in Oregon is gonna have an opportunity to see that happening uh, on a world stage and an opportunity to join in with that. Uh, so that's, for me, that's the, that's the, the emotional benefit. Mariel, any comments you want to add to that? Uh, I think it'd be interesting, Jules, for you to take this one. Since you, <laughs> I mean, since, since you, I didn't realize that you had gone and lived in London and Rio and did this other uh, kind of covert research with the, with the locals. So, I mean, it'd, it'd be interesting to see what you have to say about that. Uh, just real quick, I mean, there, the feel-good factor during the Olympics is real. So in London, when you're on the subway, everybody's excited. Um, I wouldn't say it was so much that in Rio with people that I was working with, but um, it's kind of like when some people drink alcohol. I don't drink myself, civic scholars, I'm not encouraging it. Um, <laughs> but like when somebody drinks a lot of alcohol, they feel really good for a little bit, and then they wake up in the morning and they have a hangover and they feel terrible. That's kind of what happens oftentimes in, in the Olympic city as well. Next question for the mic. Leslie Johnson, City Club member. I, I'm a bit of a fan, although being a lifelong Oregonian, I get a little bit nervous about the times things haven't worked out well for the hosts after the games. But I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to be on the Nike staff at the 1984 Olympic trials and Olympic games, and then I got my kid to the um, Men's World Cup in South Africa in 2010. Um, and the, the thing that really struck me about both those experiences as a spectator and having interaction in the community was that the rest of the world is used to travel. They're fans of going to other countries. They plan that regularly. They do it quite a bit. Oregonians, not so much. My friends haven't been many other places and don't place a priority on mixing that way. And it seems to me like that's really your, the more fundamental kind of reluctance. So put it Can in the you form address? of a question. Put it in the form of a question, of yeah. course. Can you talk about how you would overcome sort of the lack of appetite for international experiences like what the Olympics would offer? Oh, good. Interesting. Then, you want to take away? If I, if, I under, if I understood that, that question, I think that the, first of all, I think from an experience, it's an un, an incomparable experience to be at the Olympic Games. Uh, the excitement, all, everything around it. But I think that in Oregon, I would go back to Damien's point, I think that the state of Oregon has something really special to provide. And I think that that 
that message and that communication would need to be long standing and it would have to build up the platform the platform going in and the runoff coming out of it would have to be something really honed in on what the message was that Oregon uh, Oregon was pushing out there and I think that we would have an opportunity to do that and to showcase showcase it quite well. Next question. Thank you. I'm Allison. I'm a member of City Club. And right before I ask my question, uh, two weeks ago my son started the Northwest Fencing Center out in Beaverton, which turns out, little known you know, fact about us is that we have this world-class fencing center right here, right down the street, about 15, 20 minutes away. Um, and I've learned about fencing since then. And Mariel, you're a rock star, because it's, it's pretty awesome. So thank you for representing Oregon. Um, my question is that it occurred to me as everyone's talking, the idea of putting Oregon on the worldwide stage like this, is this isn't the first time. Uh, with the Lewis and Clark expedition, exposition um, well over 100 years ago, something very similar was undertaken under arguably much harder logistical measures. And I'm wondering if anyone on the panel can speak to the transformative um, impacts of that event of the World's Fair versus um, what would happen now and if there's any lessons that we learned and um, if that helps influence if we should do this or not. Great. Let's start. Damien, start with you maybe and, and then Jules, if you've got any question about the, uh, the impact of other kinds of uh, large scale uh, events and, and relate them to the Olympics. I'm afraid I don't know a lot about the impact of the World's Fair on Oregon, so I, I can't comment on that. Uh, I can talk about the impact of the Olympics on other, other cities and host, host uh, nations. Um, uh, Barcelona, uh, Jules mentioned, is often held up as an example. Um, the impact of Barcelona was enormous. Uh, today, even if you, if you take a bus tour in Barcelona as a tourist now, they will show you all the Olympic stuff that they built in 1992. Um, the reason it changed everything so dramatically from them is they were literally an industrial backwater uh, that had been uh, pushed off to the side by the Franco government. And uh, they went from long-term unemployment in the high 40s percent to halving that. Uh, they put in two and a half miles of beaches. They completely changed the future. And as a result of the Olympics, or they put it down to the Olympics, the future of that city and that area transformed dramatically to being one of the top 10 tourist destinations in the world, arguably the best soccer team in the world, uh, arguably the best restaurants in the world. So there was a massive impact. For them, it was a very positive impact. Oregonians have uh, this sort of two mindsets on what Oregon is and what we want to do. Will the games be transformative for Oregon? Absolutely. Will everybody enjoy and want that transformation? No. There's a, there's a lot of people in Oregon that want Oregon to stay as it is today and not change at all. But there were a lot of people 100 years ago, or 50 years ago, or 20 years ago that felt the same way. Change is inevitable. What we wanted to do was use the games as a way of putting guidelines or bumpers around that change so that we actually change in the way that we want to that carries on respecting our values, as opposed to just make it a capitalism free for all. Right? I mean, if, it, if, it's, if we just leave it to the way it's at, I mean, just look around the city right now, there's cranes everywhere. Do we not want more guidelines and higher percentages of affordable housing? And using the Olympics as a, as a, a big event that requires a lot of public debate and provides uh, an opportunity, not just for people like me who want this, but an opportunity for people like Jules to argue about all the things we need to be doing in our state differently, and why are we spending the money on the Olympics when we could be spending it on this? Well, this gives that forum for that debate. And I think even if we don't host it, having the conversation is positively transformed. Jules, how about a quick report, uh, retort, and then we'll go to one, our one last question uh, uh, at the mic. Sure. It's an interesting question, and part of what you suggested was this idea that the Olympics will put a city on the map. And we hear this time and time again with the bidding. They even said that in Los Angeles. Like, who doesn't know where Los Angeles is in the world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I don't feel like Portland suffers from not being known about in the world. I, I, and I also don't ascribe to the idea that Oregon has some inferiority complex with uh, California or Washington. Uh, I'm really proud of the state. If the Olympics come or they don't, we're going to be a world-class place to be. And so um, I think you know we don't need to necessarily cater to the Olympics, and we should be proud of the state we've created. Last question to the mic. Very quick one. Very quick one. Ted Kay, City Club member. Uh, those of you who are promoting this are obviously focused on Oregon. 
how would your long shot chances be increased if you considered this as a Cascadia Games and incorporated Washington and BC? Then, quick reaction. Well, I think, it's, I think that's an absolutely great idea, and I think it's actually a good model for the Olympics to look at a, you know, Western, we often thought about it as a Western part of the United States uh, Olympic Games, and I think that would be great to put track and field in one place, swimming in another, and it gets more people uh, engaged from all different geographic areas. So I would be, I think that's a great question and a great suggestion. I think it'd be a way to control costs. The International Olympic Committee has suggested that they're open to it, um, but nobody's actually taken them up on it yet. But it could be a possibility. We just haven't seen it in action yet. Lisa, do you want to you yeah. want to wrap us up? Yes, thank you. Uh, our time is up, and we need to pause the conversation for now. But we hope that this is the beginning of even more in-depth conversations for each of you. Please join me in thanking our panel for being here today. And also thank all of you for coming, and we hope to see you at another City Club event soon. We're adjourned.